work. So after all of that, I'm sorry to depress you now, okay? Um, I've, uh, I see a couple of my colleagues here from the CSIR, and I'm going to quote one of our famous colleagues at the CSIR, Peter Ashton, you know, it's about time, time to take a bite of the reality sandwich. And that's my job today. So I'm going to be as quick as I can, given the time constraints. That image there is an image that could be anywhere in South Africa. And what's significant about that is there's a little dam, a little farm dam, and this is actually in the, uh, uh, not very far from Lanseria Airport, and you'll find that the water is highly green, highly eutrophic, and this is downstream of an informal settlement. And this pretty much is a microcosm of what our water problems are in South Africa at the moment. Okay, so let's, let's just start off with some data, some, some information. In, uh, in 2000, the National Water Source Strategy was uh, published, and that used information, uh, data that is available in uh, 1998, and it gave us some very important uh, information. We've never managed to uh, numerically update the data set since then because from that moment onwards our, our technical capacity started deteriorating. So this is the last uh, empirical data that we have on which water resource management is based in the country. So there you have uh, our different water management areas and the first thing that you'll see is that we cascade water around from one river basin to another, in particular uh, up here to the Olifants River Basin, which is where all of our, um, our energy is, our, our coal, uh, Eskom, etc., etc. But we've known since 2000, this is official government data, nothing funny about it, and we've known that the following is going to happen by 2025. We know that the Berg River area, which is Cape Town, will be in deficit by that number, 508 million cubic metres. We know for, for, for a fact that the Mvortium Zimkulu will be in deficit by 788. So hearing about the Sun International hotels all along there, we've known about this since 2000. I presume you knew too, okay? And uh, the Upper Vol deficit by 764, we've known about it. The only river basin in the uh, water management area in the country that's going to be in a surplus is the Crocodile West Marika. And why is a surplus flow? Because that's all the sewage return flows out of Gauteng. So that's, uh, that's a, liter it's a fact, of, fact of the matter. Uh, Johannesburg is the, one of the only cities in the world that's not on a river, not on a lake, it's on a continental watershed divide. So it's all fantastic because we've now got this incredible infrastructure designed to pump water uphill to power and money. But unfortunately, because of that, we are situated upstream. Our sewage works are upstream of our drink drinking water resources. And this is an un, an, an, a nasty reality that we live with today in South Africa. So, unfortunately, we know that there's a, at national level, by 2025, which is not very far in the future, we're going to have a deficit of 2,044 million cubes. Let's just fast track it now to have a bite of the reality sandwich. I was uh, on my way down to Bloemfontein to do some professional work a while ago in the height of the drought. At the, at the same time, there was a selection on. And it's wonderful to have these, uh, this, this people's power democracy at grassroots level. Uh, it would be even better if that democracy could also keep the water flowing and the, and, 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 the, uh, and the traffic lights working. So, where we are, we're looking at a changing risk profile and new people are all in the corporate decision-making uh, space. So, what is, what is the stuff that's coming your way that you haven't yet figured out? At the moment, we've just come through a, an amazing drought with the worst in living memory. Six months ago, Johannesburg had one week of water left, one week of water before there was no water flowing in the streets of Johannesburg. That's an important, amazing number. And now suddenly we've got a situation where Valdam is overflowing. Is the problem over? Has it gone away? Are all the corporate risk guys suddenly satisfied and water is no longer an issue? Well, I don't think so because the, 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 the risk profile is changing. And I want to mention a word here that I want you to all to understand and I want to go and Google it and find out more about it. A toxin called microcystin. Microcystin. Please understand this. This is going to become part of your daily life in the, in the near future. Um, We've seen, for example, infrastructure failure, rainwater, bulk water supply. There's a rainwater colleague of mine here, and I'm looking into the eye now. He's going to tell me if I'm lying or not. There was a failure of a mission-critical pump station in early 2015. The pump just stopped working, and for about 10 days, Ikuruleni had no water. Uh, long story about that. There's a uranium plume coming from the, uh, the western uh, uh, mining basin that's entering the Sibicom uh, uh, well field. Uh, that we've done some mathematical uh, modeling on. And of course, the model that we did, the, the, uh, the report that we put in, uh, was classified as top secret, so I'm not allowed to talk about it, so I can't tell you anything more. Uh, we've had this uh, major drought in, the, in, in, in KZN, and all kinds of theatrical things happening with the blue scorpions going down to, uh, to uh, shut down sand mining operations in Vorti River because they accused the sand miners of stealing the water. So uh, the sand miners allegedly built these great big m m uh, piles of sand, which is going to hold back the river, which is going to then prevent it from flowing down to the ocean. So anyhow, all these sort of things have been happening. So 
when I talk about microsystem, this is a serious issue. This is Loscope Dam. And when I was at the CSR, I used to be a happy fellow at the CSR. I had a wonderful career at the CSR. And uh, we, we started getting information. I was in the, uh, the water, in the environmental uh, sector with some colleagues here yeah, in the audience. And uh, we started getting information coming from different parts of the country of strange things happening. And one of the first things that I heard about was, I think it was seven dogs from the SAPS dog school uh, at Drillaplot Dam. They went, uh, the handlers went to go and reward their dogs after a hard day's work, and suddenly seven of the dogs dropped down dead like that. That interesting. Then we started hearing about crocodiles dying, and we started hearing about turtles dying and other animals dying. And then all of a sudden we got this information here yeah, that uh, this, uh, this buffalo died. And the CSR dispatched a team there, and one of our colleagues, Dr. Paul Oberholtz, that did the autopsy on this particular buffalo, and uh, found out that that buffalo had died from this uh, toxin from this blue-green algae. And anyone that watched the uh, recent uh, 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 carte blanche program on Hollybiespo Dam, this is exactly what it is. And to quote our same famous uh, CSR colleague, Pete Ashton, uh, uh, this is too thick to drink and too thin to plow. That's the accurate description of that water there. And, and, and that triggered a, a quite a substantial amount of research work. And what we've known about is that uh, 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 the uh, microsystem toxin levels in South Africa are as shown there. Uh, 10 micrograms per litre is what Finland gets excited about. America being tough, they can do all kinds of amazing things in, in, in different parts of the world. They, they get concerned at 60 micrograms a litre. South Africa is amazingly tough the, the, to, to, to loop. touching what the previous speaker said, because we are 10,000 micrograms per litre, spiking at 18,000, and we don't apparently care about it. Okay? It doesn't officially exist. So fortunately, I'm very proud to say that the CSR has done some very, very sterling work in the recent past, and they've published some very credible work in, in 2015 that's shown that two-thirds of our, of, our of our large dams are now highly contaminated with this. And uh, it's coming through the, uh, the system. Um, the, uh, another colleague of mine at the CSR, a guy called Fritzy Carlson, some of you might remember Fritz. Fritz, uh, Dr. Fr Dr. Carlson, did his PhD on the chemistry of snake venom. And he was working with uh, Professor Rufka Kafir on this project in the 1980s. And when they started isolating the molecule of microcystin, he said, aha, I know that. It's, similar, it's chemically similar to, to Runkel's venom. And that's, that's when they actually started defining it. So we've known since 1984 what it's like. And unfortunately, this fact is denied today. Uh, it doesn't officially exist in the country. And in fact, it's a career-limiting career, career, uh, career, uh, move if you sh uh, should decide to start working on it. So what we're doing professionally is we're working with, uh, with clients now in, in various parts of the economy, and we're developing uh, with their assistance, or we're assisting them in, in developing a register of risk. And that register of risk actually institutionalizes all of this, that you can know exactly what's happening, you can, you can, uh, can mitigate it. I'm going to quickly, uh, uh, I'm going to fast track through that because of time constraints. If you want any of this information, the evolution of the science, uh, you're welcome to get this uh, slide from, uh, from, from GCX. But I just want to tell us that. What, to summarize all of the science that I've just quickly flipped over there. The, your, your cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, they produce a toxin called BMAA, better methylamino alanine, which is a long, funky name, just called a BMAA. So we know that for a fact. We know that, 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 that these organisms are also found at very high levels in all of our South African water resources. We know that two-thirds of our national water resource is contaminated. We know that blooms appear sporadically. We can't predict when they're going to happen. We know that it's bioaccumulated. We know that it's, that, it's, that it's transmitted across the fetus from mother to child. We know all of this stuff, not from work done in South Africa, but from work that's done globally. And we also know that it's, it's now entering into irrigation systems and animal production systems. So all of these things are known. And this is what it looks like from there. This is uh, flying over, uh, over the Free State. Uh, during the height of the drought, there you have a, a, a sewage works. There you have your, your uh, un uncontrolled uh, return flow of, uh, of partially treated or untreated effluent into the river, and there you have your irrigated agriculture downstream. I'm not going to go through into all these details because they're boring numbers, but what, what I want to do is I want to tell you a story about this. In the early 2000s, Department of Water Affairs officials, technical specialists, suddenly started becoming concerned about the Vile River. Vile River Water Management Area. Vile River sustains 65% uh, of the national economy and 45% of the population. It's very, very important what happens in the Vile River Basin. In fact, there's a water quality guy. Put your hand up there, please. So if anyone wants to know about Vile River water quality, he's the guy to go and talk to. Um, so what they did was a salinity study. And what they started finding, firstly, if you look at the Vile River, that's, that's the map there. And from the top to the bottom, there's a whole lot of gauging stations. And those gauging stations, for those people on that side, if I can point accurately, 
my, my laser doesn't go there. My batteries are flat. Um, uh, if your gauging stations go from number one to number 20 or something like that, and you see at the bottom there, those are the same gauging stations. So from the top there, you get a very, very low salinity level. Salinity measured in terms of, of, of TDS, total dissolved solids, as parts per million. And so you'll find what happens firstly, you've got very low TDS in the upper Vile River area, then suddenly it starts spiking out, and that it starts spiking out at a point where uh, acid mine drainage and sewage return flows out of Gauteng into the river system. Then you get an interesting thing. Uh, uh, in fact, Hanley over there, she, she worked with me some years ago on water quality, national water quality uh, objectives, okay? Uh, these, are, these are, it's a rules-based system uh, in the country whereby uh, if your water quality goes to a certain level measured in, by various parameters, in this case TDS, uh, you are obliged to do something about it if you are, are, are an official. And all you can do is you can dilute it. That's all you can do. You've got no other, other alternative. You've got to dilute it out. So at that point in time, at the Val Barrage, suddenly it starts spiking out, and it then gets, uh, gets diluted uh, uh, by uh, re uh, opening up the sluice gates in the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, and uh, that basically uh, gives you more water in the system uh, for the same amount of salt. Therefore, it reduces the TDS loading. Now, that's very important what I've just told you now, this whole idea of dilution. Because the 2006 study said, remember 2006 is before the big drought hit us, before the big drought hit us. They said that the following has to happen. They said that the first thing we have to do is we have to continue to manage the resource by, in terms of dilution using the wild barrage to 600 ppm. Am I right? That, that, that's the number. Anything over 600 ppm, you're obliged to open the sluice gates to bring in more water to bring it back to 600 ppm. So, but they then said that this, can't, this is not sustainable. Clearly, it's not sustainable because you're now using valuable, good quality drinking water to dilute out bad stuff in the river. So they then said that what we have to do in the future is we have to stop the salt from getting into the system in the first place. And that's going to require infrastructure spend for desalination of acid mine drainage uh, plants and also, more importantly, the upgrading and repair of all of our sewage, uh, sewage uh, works, most of which are dysfunctional. So that was said in, 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 in 2006. And they then said that in order to make this all happen, we have to have sign-off of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project Phase 2 by 2015. These are important deadline dates because if it doesn't happen by then, then the system goes into systemic failure. So this is where we are now. This graph comes out. Uh, this is a 2012 graph. And what's very interesting about that graph, if you look on the, on the, uh, the, the horizontal axis, you've got time and, uh, over there, uh, time. And on the vertical axis, you've got volumes of water. Now, what you'll notice is that system yield, think of system yield as the water that is surplus uh, or in excess of demand. So basically, it's the assurance of supply level of water. And you'll notice that the system yield starts coming down from 2010, and it starts crashing. Then you saw uh, those, those lines going up there. That's demand, water demand in the system. And you'll see that between 20, uh, 2010 and 2015, the system completely crashes. It actually goes into deficit. And this is an important thing because now suddenly all the dams are full and we're all happy and smiling and, and you know, and contented, but none of this has gone away, okay? So the system is in deficit because uh, the assurance of supply has gone. And assurance of supply is the guarantee of six things. Water of a given, given, given quality, at a given pressure, at a given price, at a given time, at a given place. Uh, and there's a sixth one I've forgotten about now. Okay, but there, there's six of these things. But trust me, I'm a doctor. Um, uh, I'm just getting forgetful. <laughs> it's the microsystem toxin that makes you forget things nowadays, okay? So, so, so the, the reality is that we are now in deficit. And the only way to get out of the deficit was to do two things. We had to build phase two of the Lesotho Highlands Water Scheme, sign the contracts by 2015 so the worst, first water could flow 2020 assuming no, no delays, that didn't happen. We still haven't signed the contract, or they've just been signed now, I believe, uh, but they still haven't started being, being implemented. So do what we, what we want to, and it doesn't make a difference. What we're going to do, we are in deficit until 2025, all things being equal. So we are now in the situation where, where, where because of the delayed transfer of the Polyhali Dam, as a result of this other stuff that's been going on, uh, we are now going to be in deficit. That's the, 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 the current deficit, deficit situation. So we have what I call an induced deficit. It's, it's, it's a result purely of human intervention or the failure of human beings to act in time. So put that in your mind and think about that. That's the short-term thing. But then the clever guys in water affairs, and they really are very clever guys, very talented people, they say that, aha, what we're going to do in the medium, 
before polyholide AM is working, we desalinate the acid mine drainage. And by desalinating the AMD, you don't have the TDS going into the river. Therefore, you don't have to release clean water from, from Stadfontein Dam and the Lesotho Highlands. Therefore, your system yield improves. It's quite, quite uh, straightforward. And there you have a situation where, where uh, by desalinating your AMD, uh, you buy time initially, you don't go into that system crash, and, and then when polyholy comes online, you, you go basically into an excess surplus situation again. Neither of those things have happened. We have not put any AMD desalination plant in place. We've only put neutralization plant. It takes the acid out, but it doesn't take the salts out. And we haven't done any upgrades to any of our sewage works, and I believe this to be a national crisis of note. And this is something that you people in the sustainability and risk field need to understand, in my view. So that's our situation, our induced deficit today. Okay, I'm trying to give you some, some inconvenient truths, and I hate to d dampen your enthusiasm after this, uh, this wonderful previous stuff here, okay? These are facts, these are absolute facts. This is, no opinion. This is not alternative fact, this is not, uh, not fake news, this is not Trumpism, okay? Okay, these are reality, these are real, real numbers, okay? We've got 1,085 water treatment systems for potable water in our country, fact. You can count them. Okay, 250 of these are in poor condition, and that is an understatement. I'm, I'm conservative. We've got 824 wastewater treatment works for sewage. Now the fun stuff starts. Remember, because of our structural situation in the SADC region, because of our history of, of colonial settlement, etc., we have a strange, bizarre situation where Johannesburg, where Harare, where Gaborone, where Vintuk is all on a continental watershed divide. So in all those cases, we are upstream of our drinking water. So our sewage return flows go back into our drinking water. And I know all of you cleaned your teeth this morning because you got you could not do nice, nice shiny pearly whites. I can see it. Flash them at me, I can see it now. So let me tell you another fact now. This morning when you drank your water, at least one molecule went through a dinosaur's kidney 63 million years ago. Fact. And that's the, that's the solution, because water is something that is a, it's a flux. It, it, it moves in time and space. If we can recycle it in perpetuity and respect it, and you know, we can actually continue expanding our economies, and we can be smiling, happy people, and we don't have to learn how to toy toy. We all know that white boys can't toy toy. Uh, but what we produce every day, this is a startling number, 5,128 megaliters. That's, that's 5.1 billion liters of sewage every day. That's what we produce, whether it's summer, whether it's winter, whether it's drought, whether it's flood. That's what we produce. There's a constant flow. That's why that Croc West Marika water management area is going to grow over time in, 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 in terms of volumes. Of those, we only treat 836 megaliters per day to safe discharge standards. The rest is returned untreated or at best partially treated back into the river systems. And this is an astonishing number and an absolute astonishing fact. And this is something because um, Randwater, one of the biggest, in fact, I believe the single biggest bulk water supply in the world, in the world, not in Africa, in the entire world, their engineering design was never ever set up to take sewage feedstock and make it safe drinking water. It was designed to take water from the Fahl Refir, Fahl Refir, because it's got fine suspended clay in it, and it's designed to flocculate those, those suspended particles out. They're electrically charged, so they bring them together, form flocks. The flocks are too heavy to float. Gravity kicks in, they, they, they drop to the bottom of, a, of settlers, etc., of, of, of clarifiers, and they get purged out as sludge. That's how Rand water works. Then they put a bit of chlorine in, and they pump it uphill uh, uh, for, for all of us to sustain our daily lives. None of that was designed to treat, to take sewage feedstock and make it potable water. And when we get back to the microsystem issue, microsystem by virtue of the fact that it's a little toxin, and by virtue of the fact that it's an evil little creature, it's a single cell little, little, little hohoki that is older than any other life form on planet Earth, gave us the oxygen we breathe today, and when it gets distressed, it gives the gift that keeps on giving. That's this microsystem toxin. It throws it up and says, thank you. You don't like me, I don't like you. Take this, okay? And it throws that little molecule out there. 
And there are only two water treatment technologies that are known that remove it. One of them is activated carbon. Another one is your various advanced oxidization processes. We don't have any other technologies that remove it. So that is in the drinking water. It's there at the moment. And there's consensus within scientific circles amongst people that work on this stuff that we are currently being exposed probably to it around 10 micrograms per liter. And the good news is that coming out of the home to pregnancy test kit industry, we now have home test kits for this stuff and they are being important in South Africa. So from a risk management perspective, in your hotel, or in your business, whatever it is that you're doing, you want to actually mainstream these dipstick tests because then you know exactly what you're dealing with. And you want to put activated carbon in your system because they're going to remove it. We know that it removes it, okay? So that leaves 4.2 4 billion liters every day of partially treated sewage. Now, partly treated sewage going back in the system isn't just sewage. It's partly treated, medi uh, partly metabolized medication. So for example, uh, let me just give some example. Cocaine, uh, the recreational cocaine goes back partly metabolized into the system. We're a very depressed society, it would appear, because partly metabolized Prozac goes back into the system. We happen to have a very high level of HIV uh, uh, infection in the country. So, so therefore, high levels of antiretroviral go back into, into the system. Uh, we're a sickly nation because we've got antibiotics that go back in, partly metabolized antibiotics. Most women are, in, are on some form of, of estrogen in terms of birth control, et cetera. So partly, partly metabolized est estrogen goes back into the system. Some men of a certain age seem to have some kind of problems, so they rely on a little blue pill. So this little blue pill stuff goes back into the system, okay? So all of these things end up there, but now we've got these bacteria and viruses that are growing in these, uh, in these very disturbed ecosystems, and we're exposing them to low doses of antiretroviral and antibiotic. So guess what? the probability of us spawning some kind of uh, 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 drug-resistant bug is fairly high, and we're starting to see it come out of different parts of the world at the moment now. So who knows what's going to happen in South Africa? And in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a funky thing, I want, uh, if I can remember the name, it's called um, necrotizing fasciitis. Go and look up the word, necrotizing fasciitis. It's a, it's the, it's the technical word for flesh-eating bacteria. And uh, believe me, it's horrific stuff. Uh, now, how, how bad is this? Well, at the moment, our average, our average flow of, of, of point source decant of acid drainage is 18 megaliters a day. It spikes at 60, but it's average flow of 80. So we have sewage return flows are 238 times bigger than, uh, than AMD flow. So, so it's serious stuff. Believe me, it's serious stuff. So just to wrap up, there, there are three risks that I think we all need to take care, care of. And from a sustainability perspective, I'll just quickly go through these, uh, conscious of the time. Our system integrity has been compromised. And it's not just the question of having water in the dam. We're grateful that we have water in the dam. But there's a whole value chain to take water out of the dam, treat it, you know, pump it uphill, process it, put it into the, the municipal networks, store it, pump it around, meter it, and then ultimately use it and then return it back through sewage works back into the river. All, that system integrity has been compromised. And this is a very important thing we need to understand. Microcystin and other toxins are not removed by any conventional means. So we've got a choice now. We can either say government fix it up Fix it up and do it quickly, and that might take you 10 years, everything going well, and you might be, happy, be lucky in 10 years' time. Or you can say that we accept that that's happening downstream and we're going to do something as a point of entry onto your premises or at the end of, end of pipe use, and all of these technologies are available. Think, uh, approach me and talk to some of the people about the dipstick tests. I think this is an important aspect in terms of your, of your risk mitigation going forward. If you've got kids that are, that are being... Uh, growing up in places where sports fields are being irrigated from some of these contaminated rivers. You want to watch their development. Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing. And if you're managing workers in any way that are, that are, that are irrigating or, or come into contact with, 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 with uh, primary water, uh, think of those dogs. Think, think of those, uh, those SAPS dog school animals that just uh, put their feet up like that. Okay, so the second thing is disruption of supply. Short-term systemic failure is more or less inevitable, and I believe you've got to bank, bank on that accordingly. Uh, and the, the four areas we know about, the four ma major development areas are in, in the country. If you happen to be managing a, a building or something like that, and you've got a certain fire risk protocol, and suddenly you've got a pressure loss, a loss of no, a pressure reduction because of something, what, what happens to your fire risk? I'm working with the insurance industry on in that, and believe me, they are starting to take it seriously, and you're going to start seeing coming down the line very, very soon, insurance change, changes, clause in your insurance uh, uh, policies. So you, you, you mitigate that with a register of risk, and uh, there's also the issue of loss of revenue. Someone mentioned earlier on now when, when your hotel shuts down and you can't flush your toilets, nothing focuses the mind faster than that. I promise you, okay? Nothing focuses the mind. 
And ultimately, there's this health risk, which I believe has got a fiduciary responsibility at board level. And then the final one is, because of all this nasty stuff that we're recycling, we're getting a buildup of salts in the system, and that's manifesting in a series of ways. So compromised water quality, uh, as, we, as we recycle, we're going to see this more and more often. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the sort of detail there, but basically scale buildup, et cetera, inside uh, commercial heat exchanges and what have you is an important thing. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I don't look as, quite as angry as that, but nonetheless, it's been my pleasure. And I hope, I really sincerely hope I haven't depressed you, and I hope I can give you some good news, okay? <laughs>